August 30th. Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Hebrews 12:11. There is often a severity and grievousness in the chastisements of our covenant God, which is important and essential for the end for which they were sent not to overlook. He who sent the chastisement appoints its character. He intended that it should be felt. There is as much danger in underrating as in overrating the chastisements of God. It is not uncommon to hear some of God's saints remark in the very midst of his dealings with them. I feel it to be no cross at all. I do not feel it to be an affliction. I am not conscious of any particular burden. Is it not painful to hear such expressions from the lips of a dear child of God? It betrays a lack, so to speak, of spiritual sensitiveness, a deficiency of that tender, acute feeling which ought to belong to him who professes to have reposed on Jesus his bosom. Now we solemnly believe that it is the Lord's holy will that his child should feel this chastisement to be grievous that the smartings of the rod should be felt. Moses, Jacob, Job, David, Paul were all made to exclaim, The Lord has sorely chastened me. When it is remembered that our chastisements often grow out of our sin, that to subdue some strong indwelling corruption, or to correct for some outward departure, the rod is sent. This should ever humble the soul, this should ever cause the rebuke to be rightly viewed, that were it not for some strong and dwelling corruption, or for some step taken in departure from God, the affliction would have been withheld. Oh, how should every stroke of the rod lay the soul in the dust before God, if God had not seen sin in my heart, and sin in my outward conduct, he would not have dealt thus heavily with me. And where the grievousness of the chastisement is not felt, is there not reason to suspect that the cause of the chastisement has not been discovered and mourned over? There is the consideration, too, that the stroke comes from the Father who loves us, loves us so well that if the chastisement were not needed, there would not be a feather's weight laid on the heart of his child. Dear to him as the apple of his eye, would he inflict those strokes if they were not an absolute necessity for them? What? Does this stroke come from his heart? What? Does my father see all this necessity for this grievous chastening? Does he discover in me so much evil, so much perverseness, so much that he hates and then grieves him, that this severe discipline is sent? Oh, how does this thought that the chastisement proceeds from the Father who loves him impart a keenness to the stroke? And then there is often something in the very nature of the chastisement itself that causes its grievousness to be felt. The wound may be in the tenderest part. The rebuke may come through some idol of the heart. God may convert some of our choicest blessings into the sources of the keenest sorrow. How often does he, in the wisdom and sovereignty of his dealings, adopt this method? Abraham's most valued blessing became the cause of his acutest sorrow. The chastisement may come through the beloved Isaac. The very mercy we clasp to our warm hearts so fondly may be God's voice to us, speaking in the tone of severe yet tender rebuke. Samuel, Dear to the heart of Eli was God's solemn voice to his erring yet beloved servant. Let no afflicted believer then think lightly of his chastisements. It is the Lord's will that he should feel them. They were sent for this purpose. If I did not feel the cross, if I was not conscious of the burden, if the wound were not painful, I should never take it to the mercy seat, there to seek all needed grace, support, and strength. 
The burden must first be felt before it is cast upon the Lord. The chastisement must be felt to be grievous before the tenderness and sympathy of Jesus will be sought. There is equal danger of overrating our afflictions. When they are allowed too deeply to destroy us in grief, when they unfit us for duty, keep us from walking in the path God has marked out for us, hold us back from prayer and from the means of grace, when they lead us to think harshly and speak severely of God, then we overrate God's chastisements and we prevent the good they were so kindly sent 